Welcome everyone to this event with Sir Paul Marshall called Ten and a Half Lessons of Experience. Paul Marshall is the Chief Investment Officer and Chairman of Marshall Waste, which is one of the largest global hedge funds in the world, based in London with 40 million in assets under management. But in addition to that, Paul has a very special place for us at the LSE because he was the founder of the Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship. And he's also the supporter of a beautiful new building, uh, which is going up in Lincoln's Inn Fields, uh, which will house our accounting, finance and management departments, along with the Marshall Institute. In addition to that, Paul is the founding trustee of ARC, which is a children's charity, which supports and manages 39 primary and secondary schools in deprived parts across, across the UK. And for that, he was knighted in Her Majesty's Birthday Honours List in 2016 for services to education and philanthropy. Paul, we are thrilled to have you here, and you and I are going to have a conversation about your new book, Ten and a Half Lessons of Experience. So I'm going to start with, uh, with asking you to tell us a little bit of the history. How did Marshall Waste come about, and what was how did your philosophy of investing evolve evolve over the course of the establishment and growth of the company? Uh, thank you, uh, Minush, and thank you for inviting me. And it's an honor and pleasure to be with you. Um, Marshall Waste um, started in 1997, so 23 years ago, um, and it was Ian Waste and myself. Uh, we started with $50 million uh, under management, of which $25 million came from George Soros, who is a LSE alumnus, and $25 million from families and friends. And in those days, that was a lot. Um, it's, now people start with much bigger amounts. And Ian came from a background in trading. Uh, he was head of global trading at Deutsche Bank. And I came from a background in traditional fund management. And, uh, and then we've grown up from there. And, and, and the business is really has half of it is traditional discretionary fund management. And half of it is a fairly or very sophisticated systematic uh, set of strategies uh, involving um, the big innovation we, we did was something called Alpha Capture, where we got uh, people on the sell side to start running money virtually for us, instead of uh, us running money, well, as well as us running money for our clients. And um, that allowed us to build this vast, uh, you could call it almost crowdsourcing, but also a vast database of ideas uh, on a daily, minute by minute basis about the markets all over the world. So your book starts with a, a quite a uh, rigorous and sophisticated critique of the disconnect between academic theory and market practice. And you're particularly tough on the efficient markets hypothesis and the focus on human rationality. Tell us a little bit more about your critique. Uh, so I'm obviously a little bit nervous about uh, entering into that given I'm kind of, in this call, I'm entering the groves of academia, at least uh, virtually. But the fact is that there, there is, I can think of almost no other area of life where there is such a disconnect between academia and practice. And you have essentially uh, a bunch of um, academic uh, economists with, with Nobel Prizes for various theories about efficient markets and rationality. And you have a, a large number of people in the markets who are multimillionaires and billionaires based on the fact that they think markets are far, anything but efficient. And so it's, it's, um, it's a complete disconnect. And it, you know, whenever you have a disconnect, you get jokes. So humor thrives on disconnect. And so the reason why there are so many jokes about economists is because of the absurdity of a lot of economic theory. The best, my favorite joke is the two economic, economists walking down the street and one says, oh look, there's a 10 pound note on the floor. And the other says, no, of course there isn't. There couldn't be, otherwise somebody would have picked it up. And that kind of goes to the heart of, of the problem. So why is there a problem? Uh, why has this happened in, in economics? And I think it goes right back to kind of epistemology, how we know things. And uh, obviously today there's a lot of, um, epistems of well, there's a crisis of epistemology because of postmodern theory. But if you just go back to the Enlightenment, 
there were kind of two ways of knowing things. There were, there were the empirical school or the empirical tendency. There was never a school, but uh, Richard, people like Hume and Smith, who basically were very modest about what they could know and they proceeded by very tentatively. And then there was the more rationalist school, which pretended to be more on the French side of things, uh, which was very axiomatic. Started with a hypothesis, then sought the evidence to prove the hypothesis. And most economic theory has grown out of that kind of French axiomatic rationalist approach uh, to markets. And uh, the efficient market hypothesis is, is one example of that. It, to be fair to E.G. Farmer, he only ever calls it a hypothesis. He never provides a huge amount, of, he never does provide a huge amount of data driven as evidence, evidencing of it, but he, he works with the hypothesis. Um, and then rationalism itself, the idea that we all make rational decisions all the time, um, that kind of, you know, you know, Minush and I know that that's just not true, is it? I mean, you just, you just turn on Twitter and uh, you know that uh, the cognitive elite are all in their own way completely irrational and have motivated reasoning in almost everything they do. Mm. Um, and we never talk about stupidity. And one of the things I talk about in the book is stupidity, which novelists write about stupidity, uh, like Flaubert. Academics don't talk about stupidity because you can't model stupidity. It's totally unpredictable. You can model rationality. You can't model stupidity. So you end up squeezing the way you, you frame the universe into what you can model. And uh, I do stupid things. 40% of everything I do is stupid. I, we do In the markets, you do stupid things all the time. So we all do stupid things all the time. But ac the academic world can't cope with that because they can't. They can't model it. So um, we've ended up with a kind of this set of theories which are divorced from this world which I operate in, which is complex, constantly changing, nonlinear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the two places are very just different places. The other uh, famous economist joke, which uh, is, resonates with your views on rationality, is there are two economists. Uh, walking down the road and one of them loses their keys and he keeps looking under the lamppost for his keys and the other one says but you lost your keys way back then but this is where I can see. <laughs> Voila that's exactly it. I wish I, I wish I'd known that joke for the book it's perfect. It's great. So, so you have a lot more sympathy for uh, thinkers that have taken a more behavioral approach to decision making, people like Kahneman and Tversky and, uh, and Minsky and Soros. Uh, and you talk a lot about the fallacies in, 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 in investing, the gambler's fallacy, the mean reversion, the risks of overconfidence, stupidity, etc. Tell us a little bit more about why you think those more behavioral ways of thinking about how markets operate are more relevant? I mean, they're, rele they're relevant. Uh, I mean, the proof of that is that we, we actually have embedded a lot of that work in the way we analyze our managers, analyze the, the contributors, the people who send ideas to us, analyze ourselves. Uh, and it's completely part of our daily working process. So, um, I have an optimism bias, so I tend to be over optimistic about things and, and, and uh, uh, extrapolate too far. My partner Ian, who's basically a trader, has it. Well, we, I don't think Danny Kahneman diversely talked about mean reversion as such, but we have, we call it a mean reversion bias. The closest thing is gambler's fallacy, which is if you if you if you flip uh, heads, it's more people will think the next thing is more likely to be tails. I mean that's the. Um, and, and then there are, and there are very things that you, there are cognitive biases that we integrate very specifically and mathematically to work. So the first example is disposition bias, which is um, uh, the tendency of people to cut their winners and hold on to their losers. So you can get, you can get people, we, we have live cases, and I've read about one in the book, of people who actually have a very high success ratio. So they're not, percentage of winning ideas is kind of 65, 70%, but because they cut them too early uh, and they hold on to their losers, they actually end up losing money. And, and 
That's disposition bias. It springs from a lack of self-confidence. And you can be trained out of uh, that bias if it's pointed out to you and you're shown what you're doing wrong. And like, I mean, the other one is absolutely part of what we do with everybody is anchoring bias. So almost everybody anchors to the way they started uh, doing things. So whatever they did at the outset, unless it was a complete failure, but if they've done something and it worked for a year or two, they become very anchored in that way of managing their portfolio, managing their exposures, the way they trade. And that's almost, it's very, I mean, we do have some success in getting people to change that, but anchoring bias is the, is the worst and most difficult bias to, to deal with. So in chapter six, you talk a lot about the, the kind of, um, how to get the balance right between concentration uh, which delivers high returns when you've got a good thing going uh, and diversification, which spreads the risks around and kind of homogenizes things a bit. Um, say a little bit more about how to get that balance between concentration and diversification. So, well, diversification is one of the really good things that's come, the, the modern portfolio theory, which came from Markowitz, it's one of the really good things that's come out of academia. Mm -hmm. It came out of Chicago, Yes. well before Eugene Farmer, and it's such a good theory. I mean, Markovitz described it as the only free lunch in finance, and because it's <laughs> an, a, a, genuinely, you know, it, it adds, it reduces your risk, and it adds, your, adds therefore, to your return per unit of risk. It's become very embedded in, in all of finance, and it's led to many of the worst abuses in finance. So... Um, uh, whether it be junk bonds or CDO, CDO squared, they all were built on diversification, essentially. Um, but the problem is what they were doing was diversifying bad assets and, and still uh, getting a better result than you might expect. Yeah. So what, the really good successful models of investing now try to diversify good assets uh, and, or good return streams, which is how we've, our business model has evolved and how the most successful hedge funds have evolved. Now, there is the other side of that, which is you know, the Warren Buffett style of investing. And he would say, you've got to be concentrated and diversification. He said that diversification is a protection against ignorance, which is actually a pretty arrogant statement. He said, if you know what you're doing, you don't need to diversify. Yeah. It's actually not true. Um, and you know, Warren Buffett, I wasn't that rude about him in the book, but he basically, his shot ratio uh, was, there's been a study of it since it's, it's only about 0.7. So he, he is, over the last 10, 20, 30 years, his returns, quality of his returns have deteriorated a lot. And that's partly because he has this very high concentration mm -hmm. uh, and it's owned by his position. He's owned by his positions, basically. Mm -hmm. And so the, the holy grail is to combine concentration and diversification. So how do you do that? Well, you have... Uh, on the one hand, you have a bunch of people who fancy themselves as Warren Buffett and they run small amounts of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so 10, 20, 20 positions or the ones that those that count. And then you combine them together in a fund so that the client receives a highly diversified product. And that's how we've, we've ended up thinking about both in ways we've done in Alpha Capture and in the way we've run our managers. Interesting, very interesting model, very interesting. So. Let me ask a little bit about uh, Marshall Weiss have, and, and its sort of almost unique approach to combining traditional fundamental investing with systemic, more quantitative investing. Uh, it, it, your eighth rule, your eighth lesson of experience is a machine beats a man, but a man plus a machine beats a machine. Uh, so can you say a little bit more about that? Um. Yeah, I don't know. That, I don't know where that uh, phrase comes from. It wasn't original to me. Uh, I think, and it, it it kind of can be traced back to Gary Kasparov uh, hmm. after he lost to, to Deep Blue, and he said something along those lines. You, know, you, you take the, the strategic vision of a of a man or a woman and combine it with it. He called the tactical acuity of a machine. And that's the that's that's what will win, wins and um, and I think that's where we are today and um, we have experiences of, on both sides of things working so 
it's well known that we, as a firm, had a public short interest in Carillion before it went bust, publicly disclosed short interest. And interestingly enough, that came out of our, purely from our systematic side of our business, where we were, where we were just processing quarterly financial statements. Uh, and that, that was enough to give the signals that the, the company was in trouble. And um, so machines can often actually deliver incredible, and they, because they can, pro, we can, you know, everybody can now process the data on every company and every set of accounts published anywhere in the world yeah. and use that to drive their, out, their, their positioning. That can, that can really be very, very effective. Uh, on the other hand, machines, um, and typically not being good at turning points uh, when you get, uh, because they're not, they, they, they're not very good at being forward looking. They, they, so you've got, to pro, you've got to put in a, um, a paradigm and then the machines work it out. So this year has been a disaster for machines. Not actually, for, mm -hmm. our systematic business has been fine because we've got too much human intervention in it, but the systemic, systematic farmers generally have done very badly this year. And that's probably because you've had two major turning points, one in March, yes. and then the other in November when the vaccine news came out, which you could have anticipated if you were a human, but machines were not very good at anticipating the vaccine announcement and its effect. Yeah. So um, our, for us as a business, we've become more and more, we, the challenge for us is to actually keep the human strategy and the machine strategy separate mm. because the human strategy is using more and more data inputs to drive the human insights and the machine strategy is benefiting a lot from human insights to make sure that it carries on delivering returns. So our challenge is to keep them apart, but for the next 10, 20, 30 years, it'll be how you combine human and machine insights that will determine your, your success in Alpha. Do you think the trend though is inevitably more machine and less human or not necessarily? Well, the, the trend is definitely to be involved, be using more and more data and find that there is a land grab for using more and more alternative types of data and to give you insights and to give you an edge. And that is very, very data intensive. And that will, uh, whoever wins that will, will, will have a massive advantage. Uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned, I mean, if you'd asked me this a year ago, I would have been giving you an answer which would have much been much more pro machine, but there's been genuinely uh, a big crisis. There is at the moment in the systematic end of the hedge fund market yeah. because they've done so poorly. Uh, the, the systematic usage space in Europe, there are only two firms left who've done well in that space this year. So the whole universe has shrunk massively. Well, so I, I wanted to come back to what you said about this year. Uh, your ninth rule is around risk management, and you say you need to respect uncertainty. So 2020 was presumably a huge test of uncertainty and risk management. And yeah. uh, what has it meant for you? And you've already said that many in the industry have suffered in 2020 because of that uncertainty. What has it meant for you and what are the lessons you take from 2020? Yeah, so, I mean, this is also something that uh, goes back to great economic debates, and there was a big uh, debate in the 20s and 30s with you know, Keynes and, and, uh, Keynes Frank, and Knight. Frank Knight. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, versus Ra Frank Ramsey and so on. Yeah. And Keynes supposedly lost that debate, but I think he was right. And um, Mervyn King wrote a book last year, a very good book on radical uncertainty, mm. and uh, which I always... I mean, it was, I felt very inspiring and I completely agree with it because in risk management, the, the great art and skill is to understand, work out what is uncertain and what is more certain. Everything is slightly uncertain, but there are things that are deeply, radically uncertain, which you can't quantify. That's the definition of radical mm -hmm. uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And with COVID, you had this situation where basically there was complete, in March, complete uncertainty about uh, infection rates, fatality rates, uh, mutation risk, uh, possibly the vaccine, and also about what the political reaction would be to, to it. All of those things were completely uncertain. And the skill in fund management was actually to take uh, risk off quickly and then to add it back as soon as you had convictions and to work out where, where the convictions were. And, and it was also, and, and, and in those situations, 
the most important thing to do. The thing you have, I can often have the greatest conviction about is how different operate act, actors play their part in a in a market and in a crisis. So you know you know what the Fed's going to do because there's actually a textbook. So once the Fed started getting involved, that actually provided more clarity, um, and you know to some degree what governments are going to do. And then, or at least once, as soon as you do that, then you have a you know what actors are doing. So you could, market is this huge ecology with different players, and then, and you have to work out what the players are doing and how that affects policy, and then be willing to act quickly. Um, now, the, the the maddening thing for, for many of us this year is being to watch the politicians, and I don't digress a bit, but who have absolutely no notion of uncertainty or are not prepared to acknowledge it. And so they've given science a really bad rap because they, they've kind of pretended that there's been all this certainty. And this, 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 this phrase, follow the science, there's nothing that gets me more worked up than follow, because even the scientists, none of the scientists could agree. Their models, a lot of them were very flaky, lovely, uh, and they didn't agree with the outcome and let's just acknowledge that. Let's recognize the uncertainty. And then when you get to markets, you've got to start with that modesty in front, in front of what you're facing and then gradually build the certainties and then act when you have them. Yeah, yeah, very true. So true. So true. So let me, um, let me turn to uh, the 10th chapter in your book. One of the things you say, it, it, it reminds me of something that uh, someone I admired greatly uh, called Faisal Abed, who used to run the something called BRAC, which was the largest NGO in the world that fought poverty. And he would always say, small is beautiful, but big is necessary. Uh, and so <laughs> your, uh, your temple is size matters. Uh, and I yeah. think it's about scale and the informational advantages that come with scale. Say a little bit more about why size matters. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not saying the friend, same as your NGO friend, actually. Um, small is beautiful. And unfortunately, now the entry barriers to hedge funds have gone up a lot. So it's quite hard for people to start when they're small. Um, but actually, what I'm saying is that there is this great unwritten deceit, unspoken deceit in fund management, which is that people try to be as big as they can. Uh, normally just because it's in their interest to have a lot of assets on the management so they get paid bigger fees. Yes. yes. But in fact, uh, and, and size is an impediment to performance uh, once you get to a certain level. And I, li I lived that, my first firm, which was a great firm called Mercury Asset Management, it was the largest mm -hmm. manager of pension funds in Europe. Uh, but they, they grew from 11 billion when I joined to 180 billion under management, which was a lot in those days, and they got too big. And they they were, you know, earning 10% of most FTSE companies. And the positions, they didn't own the positions, the positions that owned them, if they were wrong, they couldn't get out in time. Mm -hmm. And so we've grown the Marshall Waste by basically regularly closing. Three years in, when we reached 2 billion, we gave back a quarter of the capital. And it was only when we found new ways of innovating and running money, new sources of alpha in a different way that we allowed ourselves to grow. So I'm actually saying size is a real impediment to performance. Oh, that's in interesting. Most places. And so you don't let yourself grow too big? No. Sort of no I mean, which is a paradox, is we're quite big for a hedge fund, but we've actually closed everything a long way along. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So another big theme in the book is fallibility and your 10 and a half rule is that like with politicians, most fund management careers end in failure. Um, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> well, first like, of all, the point about- It's definitely true for politicians, but it's also true for fund managers. I think it is. Um, so uh, I've got to, I'm, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a dangerous place to, to, to say it. And um, the, first of all, on fallibility, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is the idea of success ratio. So you percentage of winning trades. The best fund managers in the world have a success ratio of 52, 53%, which means 47% of the time they're wrong. So every day, every day you feel a schmuck, every day. So it, keep, it should keep you very 
anchored and rooted and, and aware of your own fallibility. But uh, the problem with, with uh, one of the problems with fund management is that people, fund management, for those who attach a lot of importance to money, they, they get, people get revered because they've made a lot of money. There's a kind of slightly hero cult. You get these cult uh, status for a lot of people. Um, you get, they ignore the tenth rule about size mattering. So they allow, they allow assets to grow and grow. So if, you, if you've done well, you've got a good track record, more and more people want to invest with you. You get bigger, you don't say no. Then you get very, very big and you can't, you lose all your flexibility. Uh, then, then you believe, you start believing your own publicity. So you get hubris uh, and uh, you start, stop taking advice from people around you. In the hedge fund world, because the entry barriers are, are, have been low and the economics are good, a lot of firms are 100% owned by one person. Mm -hmm. So that's very easy in that situation to not brook any contradiction. Yeah. So uh, you, the, the, the likelihood of all these factors coming together is high. I mean, Neil Woodford in the UK is classic. Mm. Almost all of the ingredients were there uh, for that blow up. Julian Robertson in the, in the States, a lot of US hedge funds have ended up blowing and making a, blowing up and making a very poor weighted average return for their investors over time. And that's because of all the pitfalls in the industry. And, and so the kind of underlying theme in the book, one of them is that Skill is persistent. There is lots of evidence that skillful people can carry on doing it year after year. Mm. The main enemy of performance is not that they lose their skill, it's that they, they it's character. They blow up, they get arrogant, they get they start believing their own hype. And so that's why most of us end up failing. It's interesting. Your description of the trajectory for fund managers was sounded very similar to why politicians fail. Hubert. Yeah. Stop listening to other ideas, believe your own press, uh, and uh, you end up making bad decisions. Good parallel. That's right. Let me ask if uh, I'm going to switch to uh, a few questions that we've received from our Alternative Investment Society at LSE. And I'm just going to remind the audience that they can type questions into the Q&A and they can also vote for the questions in the Q&A that they would like to see answered. Uh, and I will try and take the questions that get the most votes. But let me start with the ones from the Alternative Investment Society. So the first one is that you have previously spoken about the so-called Davos orthodoxy and how global elites have been singing the praises of globalism while ignoring the issues of working class people in the West in the advanced economies. And you're currently speaking to a group of students who are incredibly international and at a high performing university. What message do you have for the new young globalists? <laughs> uh, it's a great question. And um, again, I've got to be careful uh, how, I, how I answer that. But I mean, you, Manoush, and me, we're very lucky and everybody on the call, call we, we are in a very fortunate group. Okay. Um, I do believe that global policy has been run for the last 15, 20 years for the cognitive elite. Uh, I believe that the, the, the way we dealt with the financial crisis and subsequently was totally biased towards bailing out the banks uh, and then bailing out the holders of assets. Monetary policy benefits the 1%. Uh, so I, I'm a huge personal beneficiary. It's totally unfair. Uh, it's not acknowledged by the political. You, you should either change monetary policy and from QE to something more expansive, or you should at very least have it acknowledged by um, a politician so that there are fiscal policy adjustments to, 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 to offset it. it. Yeah. Uh, but none of that ha happens. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the global elite, uh, uh, we've all got to understand that um, we're, we, all souls are, are created equal. I mean, every soul matters. And I think that the 50% are increasingly running themselves, running things, they're only caring about the 50%, the cognitive elite. Mm -hmm. And there is a lack of empathy and care for the people who've not participated in higher education and, 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 and are benefiting from the system. And that would matter, that would be perhaps a fairer position 
if the education system itself wasn't so unfair. Mm -hmm. So certainly the US is totally unjust, the education system, uh, the way it's funded, uh, and indeed higher education. UK is not a lot better. Uh, so we all, I mean, there, are, there will be people on the call who've made it from nothing, but there are others. I'm, I'm, I was, you know, I went to private school, I've completely, had a completely privileged background. It's been too easy. And we, therefore, our focus needs to be on what Hillary Clinton called the deplorables. The 50, the 50 or 60% of the population who have been left behind by these changes. That's, that's what our overwhelming focus should be on. Uh, and of course, I don't call them deplorables. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, that term, she was much criticized for even using that term. Um, yeah. It revealed a certain attitude. Um, very good point. So let me, um, actually, while we're on this theme, I'm going to take the first question in the chat, which has the most votes, which is uh, from Julius Weitzel, who's uh, a uni at the University of St. Gallen, actually, in Germany, and, and listening from Germany. Switzerland, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. Yes. He's BA student. Oh, I'm sorry. He's in Switzerland, but he's a student from Dusseldorf. He's from Germany. Very okay. good. You're right. He's absolutely studying in Switzerland. How do you see ESG criteria impacting your daily decision making in terms of investment opportunities? Is ESG becoming the new normal in, in, in terms of investment criteria? And how do you. So it, it, yeah. So uh, in the last two years, it's been completely transformational for our business and there are um, there's, there's a huge amount I could say about that um, the, the main thing to say is that historically ESG as a criteria there was no despite what a lot of the press said there was actually no evidence that ESG was a driver of superior returns uh, however in the last 18 months that has changed and the E is now uh, absolutely clearly a driver of superior uh, returns in, if you use that criteria. And um, we've been doing, implementing that for uh, 12, 18 months in our portfolios and in, very, in lots of different ways. Some of it systematically, some of it by integrating it into what managers do. Uh, but I think for the next 10 to 15 years, decarbonization will be one of the along with what's going with digitalization and uh, what's going on in health and, and uh, synthetic biology, absolutely do dominant in, in, in driving superior returns. Now that's one, that's, that's looking at the return side. The other side is governance. And I would say that hedge funds generally have been a bit poor on this, including ourselves in integrating it into our governance. Um, but we're now, um, we launched an ESG fund uh, and we uh, are, have introduced very systematic uh, work across the firm, voting every share in every meeting through the governance process um, and developing our own set of standards for both S and G. Uh, and it's not happening in the States yet. So we're, I think Europe is ahead. It's what, the one thing Europe's ahead of the States on. The only thing really. Um, the, uh, but, but uh, so it, we actually, it's actually a business opportunity for us as well to be a, to be a leader in that space. But it's, it's, it's really massive. It's, it's the, one of the biggest things happening in our industry. Actually on that theme, uh, we recently did a session with Ronnie Cohen on impact investing and yeah. arguing that uh, the city of London should position itself as a sort of center for ESG and impact investing, because as you say, it's slow to, to happen in the US. Yeah. Do you think that's possible? And what would the city have to do in order to become the place where that sets the standards, that has the big pools of capital and so on? Well, I think you're right. The, 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 the key, probably the, the two key things are setting the standards and having a big pool of capital allocated mm -hmm. to it. And the, the standards are coming from various different parts of Europe. So uh, Sustainalytics is based in Holland. Uh, UNPRI is based in London. There are, there are different standard bodies competing. Mark Carney's role is very helpful uh, because he's based in London and he's a, one of the biggest global advocates. Um, London's doing well in terms of listing green sovereign bonds, but we're not clearly the leader yet. So I, I, I'm hoping and I'm trying 
you know, to encourage government to really take a take a lead on this. And it relates to setting standards, encouraging pools of capital to be here rather than anywhere else, um, and encouraging trading of things like ETS, hydrogen, uh, new types of um, um, uh, commodities that are related to to the to the kind of green wave. So there's there's lots to do, but it's London has a good chance, but it's not a done deal yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me go back to a question from the Alternative Investment Society, which is you frequently reference a wide range of ideas. Which books and ideas have been most influential in your worldview, and what books and ideas would you urge students to explore? And there's also a question in the chat, which is somewhat related from Paul Pember, which is, what's the biggest learning from your career? Well, uh, well the books, I, 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 I ten and a half learning, so I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. Um, the books, I, I would I kind of put them in a slightly separate case from the professional work. So uh, the, I guess one book is um, The Good Egg like Archipelago, uh, Solzhenitsyn, because of the, you know, the, 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 the deep, deep, A, the understanding of com where communism leads, but also the deep learning uh, that the line between good and evil doesn't line between, uh, between people, but within each of us. And that is such a, and it's obviously a Christian insight, but it's a deep, it's, it's a thing that we should all kind of imbibe every day in the way we interact with everybody and everything. Um, George Orwell, um, not because, well, not because of, not because of 1984, kind of freedom of expression, but uh, Road to Wigan Pier, understanding the nature of uh, socialism. He was a socialist all his life, but he also said, yeah. socialists don't uh, lo uh, love the poor, they hate the rich, <laughs> uh, which was, uh, you know, that, that's also, you know, I, I started on, you know, on the left in the Social Democratic Party. So I had experience of that, and I think there's a large element of truth to that. Um, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. I have a third book. I think it's incredibly important uh, intellectual. And his book, Map, not The Twelve Rules of Life, but Maps of Meaning, which is about understanding meaning uh, in a postmodern world. So, what, what, and I would recommend everybody to read that. It's a, it's a remarkable book, uh, very different from The Twelve Rules of Life. Uh, and uh, how you think about meaning now. So th those will be some examples. The, um, in terms of lesson for the career, I mean, well, I've written, as you say, I, the, the book was deliberately titled, by the way, Lessons from Experience rather than Rules. Mm. And that was intended to kind of give an idea of fallibility as well, because it, it's the idea that we're constantly learning. I, I, I would never turn a lesson into a rule. We've just been learning and learning and learning and we'll carry on learning. And most of my lessons are from my failures. Uh, and, you know, I was lucky enough that I failed. I failed really badly in my early stage of my career by uh, actually around the Gulf War. Um, well, actually, there's a question in the chat, in the Q&A from a Matthew Norris, says, what is your biggest career mistake and what did you learn from it? So, it's All right, so yeah, so... Um, so I got the first Gulf War, I got very bad up about uh, the effect on the oil price. So I was long oil, uh, oil service companies, you know, typical rookie era. And um, before the invasion, so I thought when, you know, once the troops went in, there would at least be a few weeks when these, these things would go up. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, uh, my wife's uncle, who's quite experienced, said to me, don't worry, never underestimate the American military. And, um, and of course he was right. And from the, the, the day, uh, I think it was August the 2nd, the American troops went in, the oil stocks all collapsed, the day. I had no time at all to sell my positions. And I, and I had an appalling year, but luckily my boss uh, forgave me and uh, gave me another chance. But I mean, that was, uh, you learn from your mistakes basically. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Um, let me actually, uh, another question from the Alternative Investment Society and then I'll go back to the Q&A. Are there any particular models of venture philanthropy like Endeavor or the One Arc Fund, uh, the One Acre Fund, sorry, that you're a big fan of? 
Um, well, I, I, I would, uh, I think both of those are quite sophisticated and developed um, uh, models. And I, I would, and, they, and they're kind of finance orientated to some degree. I would really encourage everybody to think, everybody to think of themselves as a venture philanthropist, because for me, venture philanthropy is seeing a problem and trying to work out a solution, solving a problem. And uh, whether or not that involves sophisticated finance, I think is secondary because I think everybody has it in them to be a philanthropist, um, to, to, to just to look at social injustices and, and, and problems in society and find, develop ways of, new, new ways of thinking about them and solving them. And so uh, rather than say, here's a kind of big thing that I admire, I would, I would just say here, there are loads and loads of interesting small things that all of us can do. Um, and, and we can just think creatively and never underestimate your ability to, to, to deliver on something like that. Well, so that actually brings me logically to ask you, what was your thinking when you created the Marshall Institute? And how did your philosophy of philanthropy shape that investment? So at, the, at that point, which was, I guess, I don't know, five, six years ago now, mm -hmm. um, Tom Hughes Hallett and I um, were of the view that philanthropy uh, and, and social entrepreneurship had very limited recognition in any academic circles. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the problem was twofold. One was that actually there's very little academic study of the nature of altruism, the nature of what is, what does philanthropy mean? What are the incentives around that? What, it, you know, Adam Smith wrote the theory of moral sentiments before he wrote the world of nations. That was all about altruism. Mm -hmm. and, but nobody's ever carried on that work. And that's one set of issues. And then the other is that there is no real, there was no real place to teach people the skills of venture philanthropy in the same way as you learned an MBA. I mean, I did an MBA, mm -hmm. one of the best years I spent in my life. And it gave me a lot of useful skills. And yet the, nobody was providing that for budding philanthropists. So we said, well, let's, let's try and do this. And the interesting thing was, as you know, we went to all the main uh, academic institutions in the UK. And uh, one of them who will be remain, name, remain nameless, their reply was, well, I think jolly interesting, but uh, I'm not convinced that uh, philanthropy is a proper academic discipline. Now that is, very reminiscent of what happened to the webs when they set up the LSD, which is that nobody recognized economics. Now, maybe people were right not to recognize the economics given what I've said earlier, but um, nonetheless, I think there is a huge amount of potential in, in developing the way we as a uh, think about philanthropy. And, and, and the final thing I'd add is the, 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 the young, younger generation, the 20 year olds and 30 year olds, are much more interested in altruism and giving things back than my generation was. And, and bravo to them. And uh, you know, I apologize on behalf of my generation, which is much more materialistic. So the extent that we can give people the tools to make a difference, uh, uh, then, that's, then that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We certainly see that in, uh, among our own students, huge interest yeah. in, in, in giving back. Let me turn to a couple of more um, of more uh, kind of investment oriented questions. One from Jigar Patel, uh, who's an LSE alum. What are your thoughts on trade execution and transactions costs? And what techniques do you use to minimize market impact given the large positions that you're executing? Well, here yeah, I've been a total beneficiary of my partner because I, I, I was a complete uh, Luddite on this. Um, but Ian, because of his background in trading, when we developed the top system, um, which is where we're processing thousands of ideas, trade ideas a, a, a day coming from virtual contributors with uh, alpha, the, the, the alpha in each trade idea varies between some of them five days, three days, some of them two years, and you can evaluate each person, each source to understand the alpha. He understood very quickly that we needed to massively drive down 
our trading costs if we were to take advantage of the, uh, the alpha in the short term ideas. So we led, certainly in a European context, completely led the way in driving, this was, this was 1995, six, that we, we hired actually the head of algorithmic trading from Citadel uh, to be in charge of that, converting all of our trading systems to algorithmic almost 20 years ago now, no more than 20 years ago. Um, and that's, that's been a huge competitive advantage to us, probably added two or 3% a year to our gross returns. And the, the frontier is constantly shifting. So the frontier is still is emerging markets now where the trading costs are still high. But in, in Europe and the US and so on, there are still very big opportunities. And the issue in Europe is that the EU is pretty protectionist about um, trading venues and uh, protecting the exist status quo. And one of the questions about London is the extent to which it, uh, it deviates from Europe in allowing alternative venues and so on, which will make it closer to the US in that. So we're looking at that. But the, big, the remaining big opportunity in terms of quantum gains is much more emerging markets now than developed markets. Yes, yes. And let me, uh, Aaron Parwar, who's a recent LSC, MSC in finance, asks, so Paul, do you see a race to zero for fees in the investment management industry? Many fund managers seem to ab abolish traditional active fee structures in favor of index strategies where costs are slashed considerably. Uh, I see a hollowing out of the middle ground. Mm. So what's actually, what's actually happening is that the, the, the successful funds, the fees, if anything, are going up. So the guys, our, our average fee actually is going up. Uh, because we're gradually eliminating discounts. And, uh, but the kind of middle ground, which is less competitive and, and so on, their fees are continuing to erode. So I would say it's a kind of barbell situation. Well, you've got the passive, which is charges nothing. Then you've got active. Good active will be able to charge fees. Poor active will gradually erode and, until they disappear. And then the, there's still the, the expensive end of the market where the fees are absolutely fine. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like in so many industries, this bifurcation where you get a kind yeah. of wholesale low margin and a commodification at one end of the industry and a That's right. premium end uh, on the other side. Okay, I've got a question from Bill Hall. Many people believe that a growth in inflation will be needed to resolve the huge global debt burden taken on to fight COVID. How do you factor that into your long-term investment thinking? So I agree with that. Uh, okay. I, I you think, think we're going to have um, a, a, another a bout of financial repression. I, I, I think, I mean, nobody's ever going to say it. The, the politicians are never going to say it. And actually, I don't even necessarily that, that many of them think it in, uh, yet. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, ultimately we need wartime monetary policy. So, so uh, the, 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 the accord between the Treasury and the Fed. Um, uh, from 42 to 47, uh, where, where they effectively just issued bonds directly uh, uh, to the Fed. Uh, will some version, we, we're not going to end up with that yet, but I think that eventually the West is going to come to the view that they have to uh, create some more inflation to get ourselves out of the situation. We're not going to have a repetition of austerity, it's a different era. So we were talking about before the call about Janet Yellen. Um, sounds like she's going to remain slightly on the, the orthodox end. So I don't think at the moment we're going to move to a position where we're actually going overtly try and create inflation yeah. at the central bank level. But I think there's going to, there may well be covert creations, creation of inflation or attempts. And I, so in terms of how we're positioning, when I, 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 I'm positioning not, I'm thinking le less that there's going to be inflation in the next year or two. But there's going to be negative rates, negative real rates, which will be part of the means of creating inflation. I think so, it'll take time. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you a question on, on this theme. I mean, the current the current problem as a former central banker is that we don't we can't we can't seem to generate any inflation. Uh, inflation. Yeah incredibly low and that's why interest rates are so low and of course the fundamental driver of this is that world savings are very high relative to investment 
And people are saving a lot because they're getting, you know, because populations are aging, hence not surprising that the bits of the world that have the lowest interest rates are Europe and Japan, which are aging most rapidly. But it seems to me that the real solution to generating a bit of uh, inflation and getting in interest rates up off the floor is, uh, is to increase investment. So the, you know, the problem is not saving is too high, it's that, you know, investment is too low. And if you could generate more investment demand, you could then you know, see a rise in, in, in interest rates. Yeah. So why do you think investment is so low in the world when there are, you know, there are such huge needs everywhere? Um, I think it's because partly because of a prevailing orthodoxy about uh, uh, in relation to investment, which I think still pertains in the US and the UK. Uh, you know, we, we kind of this there's an era from '79, which is kind of to to today, which is kind of which is a Milton Friedman type orthodoxy, mm. where we've all been quite scared of heavy government involvement. Um, so, because the, 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 ultimately the investment is going to have to come from government, or it's going to be have to be pump primed or framed by government policy, and government's been very reluctant to do that. Mm. And so, I think that. That's, I think that's going to change now, at least in the US and the UK. I'm not sure about Europe because of the German orthodoxy. Um, I think the second point, if you go to the, to the corporate sector, I think there's actually much more investment than we allow, but it's not classified as investment because the nature of the economy today is that a lot of the ways companies invest is actually R&D, which we don't classify as investment. Mm. Um, but ultimately, everybody's now being paid through the bond market to invest. And, and governments, I think, are finally taking the hit. So I think yeah. the US and the UK will lead the way in, in re really wrapping it up. The other thing, things I would add is reasons why we haven't had inflation are demographic and disruption. Mm -hmm. And um, Japan, which is ahead of the game, if you like, in this, they've got this big demographic problem, which uh, the US and the UK don't have, which has added to their inability to great inflation. But I think that uh, in due course, it's going to happen because uh, governments, I think the orthodoxy is going to shift more and more towards allowing governments to, just to spend. Yes, yes, interesting. Okay, I'm going to go back to questions from Ilya Korobov, who is an MSc in finance alumnus of the LSE. Thank you for your conversation. It's really insightful. My question is, what is your view on value investing? Do you see current vaccine-induced flirtation back to value as a turning point or rather a correction? <laughs> so uh, AQR, who were the inventor, who, who, who translated Eugene Farmer's work on on factor investing into a business model, which is for buy value momentum, are maybe toast now as a, as a firm. They've had an appalling year. And, um, and even, I think even with the recovery in value in the last three or four weeks, they're, they're still got such, such a, a very long-term problem. Uh, and value, as the person who asked the question knows, has underperformed since 2009. My, our view, my view is that we're probably gonna get nine months now of rotation into value. But value, I find it almost a completely unhelpful uh, definition uh, because value um, is primarily related to price to book and, and, and measures like that. And uh, it's led to, it's associated with certain sectors underperforming like banks uh, and certain industrials and, and, and so on, insurance. But a lot of those are underperforming for reasons which are fundamental. And so you can get rotation in and out from time to time. But ultimately, the value factor has lost out to much deeper fundamental things that are happening into way, in the way the economy is changing. And if, if I had to invest on a 10-year view, I'd be buying the themes that I mentioned earlier, you know, digitalization, decarbonization, uh, transformation in, in medical science. And those are going to be where you're going to make money in markets on a 10 year view. On a nine year view, you might have a big rotation back into recovery names because they got so depressed, but that's it. Okay. We've got loads of questions coming in. I've got 26 questions. I'm going to get through them at try and get through some at pace. Uh, from Donald Glancy, which data sets have you found most valuable for equity strategies? Uh, I'm not going to answer that one because. 
<laughs> that is getting into the Tell secret me. sauce. Yeah, exactly. all would, yeah, all I would say about that is that even the ones that people thought were commodified, most one commodified data set people thought was credit card data. And when we started using it, we thought that would be not very yield very much. Actually, it's been very valuable. So I would say today, depending on how you use it, almost every data source is still valuable. Interesting, yeah. Uh, from Bill Smith, do you think hedge funds bear responsibility for the treasury market meltdown in March? And do you agree or disagree with calls for some for greater oversight or regulation of hedge funds? Um, to be honest, I haven't thought about that. I don't, I think it's very, I mean, the fact that it hasn't come across my, the, the blaming hedge funds for the meltdown has not come across my desk, if you like, as an issue I've had to defend. Um, so I don't, I mean, I think it's much more likely it was risk parity. Uh, it was certainly that risk parity meltdown was responsible, i.e. Bridgewater and so on, which is a hedge fund, of course, uh, but, but that's not their hedge fund business. Um, uh, so I think risk parity was responsible for the sell down in gold. Uh, I doubt very much they were responsible for uh, the sell down in, in, in the treasury market. I think that would do many other things other illiquid investors were responsible for that. Yeah. How about, uh, let's go back to education. Jacob Straffer is asking, uh, you said the education system should be changed so that everyone has an equal chance at a good education. What's your opinion about inheritance tax? Uh, I'm in favor of it. Uh, so I agree, agree with Bill Gates Sr. Uh, I think Ta the tax system is, is one of the best things to tax, basically, um, because you look at what we tax, we tax work. 60% of all taxation is on work. 20% um, is on consumption. 10% um, uh, is on property or something and, and um, or assets, and uh, the rest is on things that are bad for you. It's complete, our tax system is industrial age, and I would have much more on uh, things that are bad for you, yeah. as little as possible on work, and quite a lot on assets, uh, including inheritance tax. And this impossible thing to, it's very, very hard politically to do, but I would start by removing all the loopholes for inheritance tax, which are advertised every weekend in the Sunday Telegraph. <laughs> I get rid of all of those loopholes. <laughs> yeah, that would make you very unpopular with readers of the Sunday Telegraph, but from a it would. economic point of view, it's, the problem is inheritance tax. Only 6% of people who should pay inheritance tax pay it. And those are all the people who can't avoid it. So that all the really rich people avoid it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Uh, let me uh, go back to James Smith. General principles and rules of thumb you use for position sizing. Very specific question. I suspect you don't have any rules of thumb. It's probably a bit more sophisticated than that. But position sizing? Uh, we, we do uh, mean variance optimization, uh, most of our managers. So they, they so that is, like that, that's a, if you like, that's a rule of thumb, but it, you know, so we, all of our, our analysts come up, produce price targets and downside targets. And then we look, and then we put them into an optimizer, uh, uh, comparing them to the vol of the positions and, uh, uh, and the correlation, and that, and that spits out recommended positions. Okay. And we don't, but, 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 but we don't follow that automatically. That's a kind of a bench, we then use that as a benchmark. Okay. Let me turn to Aditya Rajan, who asks, uh, do you see any new asset classes on the horizon that you think will be transformative? Um, well, there's a lot of asset, assets that have to become more uh, liquid and on exchange. So even the credit markets are very, a lot of it's off exchange. That there's a big process that has to happen to make much more of that on exchange. And then I think there's a lot of um, potential excitement in, in, in terms of uh, pricing externalities and, and, and pricing uh, uh, and, and make the carbon credit market, making that a much more bigger liquid market. And as I mentioned earlier, 
trading in hydrogen, trading in nitrogen, the, the, thing, the things that are important to the, uh, uh, to, to the, environment, the environmental side of the things. So those will be the, um, the areas which, which I would like to see. Um, and uh, we have a tendency to commodify too many things. Uh, so Facebook has commodified human relationships, which is a disaster. Uh, but, but, but in terms of financial markets, I think trading things that relate to the environment would, uh, generally would be a good thing provided if we're putting a price on them. Very good. I'm going to turn to Andrew Ralph, who asks, given how much things have changed since 1997, what advice would Sir Paul give to a startup hedge fund manager today? If you were speaking to your younger self, what would you, <laughs> what would you advise? Um, well, it, it's a very different time, and, and I'm, as I mentioned earlier, in 1997, the uh, entry barriers were relatively low, and you could start with a small amount of capital. Today, it's extreme. You need, I think, the latest estimate, you need $400 million of capital just to cover your kind of compliance costs and your trading overheads and so on. It's becoming much more difficult to start. Uh, so I would, uh, my advice actually would be, Learn the ropes, learn, learn spend 10, like, like I did actually, 10, 15 years learning about fund management. Make your mistakes in a place where you can afford to make the mistakes. And then, um, uh, and then make sure you've got the right partners. Mm. I mean, the best thing I, I, you know, I was very fortunate with my business partner and, and then also fortunate with the right backers. So find the right partners and the right backers. Yeah, very important. Very important. And what should young people just starting their career learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? That's from Aditya Rajan. She also asked quite rightly, most and finally, most importantly, why didn't Sir Paul go to LSE? <laughs> My sister went to LSE. Oh, okay. Well, at least that. <laughs> uh, I, I, and uh, my sister's a distinguished journalist. So she's a distinguished LSE alum. She got a BAFTA award for her work in Bosnia. Ooh. And um, I would have, I wish I had gone to LSE is the answer because I went to, to Oxford and it was uh, pretty stuffy. And um, I, I, mean, I, I don't regret the studies, but, uh, but I would write, LSE is a much, was a much more, and is I think today, much more internationally orientated place um, and um, very, very open. To new ideas, and um, I forgot what the first question was. But that, that's the question was, what would what should young people starting their career learn from the COVID nineteen pandemic? I mean, this generation. Oh, there's all I worry about them because this gen. Of course, there's all this research that shows that if you enter the labour market at a time of economic crisis, you you uh, you suffer in terms of expected wages uh, for quite for many years thereafter, and it is a world. Uh, in turmoil in many ways, but what should young people who are just starting their career learn from the pandemic and how should that shape their career choices? Well, I think, I, first of all, I think that uh, we're going to bounce back. I, I mean, I, it's been appalling for young people. Yeah. Um, and in fact, generally policy in the West for the last 10 years has been pretty bad for young people. Um, but I think, first of all, in COVID, we will bounce back from much faster than people expect once we have the vaccine. So I'm actually optimistic. We're gonna, it'll be a feel like a boom by this time next year. Um, we're gonna have the fastest GMP growth in, uh, certainly in my, probably my investment career in the West next year, I think. Um, I think what people learn is down to their own personal experience. Uh, I'm sure it's made a lot of us, a lot of people focused on the needs of the people who are struggling around them. And so it'll only add to the, the kind of importance of altruism and, and making a difference to those around, those around us. And, and I guess we also, we learn about fragility, uh, fragility of all of our lives and, and, to, and about our fallibility. And I think that's, it's never a bad lesson. No, quite. And the other thing is, I guess that um, COVID has, has accelerated trends in the economy, 
both in terms of sectors that were in decline and sectors that are yeah. on the rise. You know, we, retail is an obvious one, which is was, you know, in transformation, but is now, you know, rapidly transforming and becoming more digital. Uh, and other sectors which are which will really be on the rise. Um, and I so it'd be interesting to hear you talk about, I often refer to it as a K-shaped recovery. You know, as we have a big decline and some things go up and some things go down. What's your take on what the K, what's, what's the upside of the K and what's the downside of the K? And I'm guessing that a lot of the students listening will want to think about their careers in that context of where the yeah, opportunities are. Definitely they should think about their careers in that context because uh, Undoubtedly, one of the reasons, I mean, I'm, things I've been fortunate with in, is that I, almost by accident, I chose a, a sector which was hardly exist, fund management hardly existed in 1985 as a, as a business, and hedge funds didn't exist at all. And um, so I've been very fortunate, and being in the right sector is, is really helpful. And um, I would say it's... For digitalization, it's just, you know, it's the Lenin thing about there are, there are years when nothing happens and weeks when years happen. And, and um, digitalization is just massively accelerated change. Um, and, uh, but the trends are obvious and, and I don't think uh, anything's gonna get in the way of that. And um, decarbonization is massive and affects many, many sectors. Mm. Not just the ones that are, you know, not just energy and uh, so on. And um, so, and that's actually just, that hasn't necessarily accelerated this year. That's just carried on. And it's in stock market terms, it's just, it's just going to explode now under Biden because the US has been kind of behind. So that, that's obviously a, a place to, to work uh, which is, covers a very significant part of the economy for the next 20, 30 years. And I'm, I'm in what seems to be a rather un, uh, narrow camp of people who think there's a, think there's a problem, but think there's, that we're going to solve it quite comfortably. But it's going to take 20 or 30 years to solve it. So it's a lifetime and a lifetime of great work. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I was looking today at synthetic biology and, 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 and you know, biology is going to become the... Uh, the next big thing, I think. Uh, and so for, there's only a very small number of companies that are still on the market that are in this gene editing and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but that's going to massively, it's going to totally disrupt chemicals, the food industry, tools, pharma. So vast swathes of industry as well. Uh, so um, there, are, there, are, there are many, many very attractive, FinTech, I mean, the fourth one, which, you know, London is a great center for FinTech, the center for FinTech probably. Uh, and, and, and I think digital currencies are gonna become huge. So there's actually, it's, um, it's an incredibly exciting time. Mm. If you're looking around for growth industries uh, to be involved in, I mean, there's, there's, just, there's just a wonderful array of choice, much more than when I started. Yeah. When it wasn't obvious, or, you know, I'm sure, I mean, you're younger than me, Minish, but it wasn't so obvious that there was just so much massive change in the yeah. 80s. Yeah, it's true. And you're absolutely, I mean, moments of change are moments of opportunity because things get yeah. shaken up. And especially if you're a young person, those are moments when you can, uh, you can, if you're in the right place at the right time, you can, you can do a great deal. Yeah. I might just, um, I think maybe as a final question, uh, I think this is a really good final question given your career and your personal story from Chris Chia, who's an LSE undergraduate. Many students at LSE are interested in pursuing careers in finance, but they're also interested in addressing socioeconomic issues and philanthropy. What would you recommend to them and how can one align a career in finance with creating Meaning, meaningful social impact as you have managed to do. And I just, maybe just a, a addendum to that question. In the olden days, uh, the approach was, you go to the city, you make lots of money, and then you do your philanthropy afterwards. Um, I think this generation and what you've managed to do is to do them, it is to integrate those, those two things. Talk a little bit about how you've done that and, and why you've done that and what your advice would be to others? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, 
I think that, as you say, in the, in, there was a period when people thought, well, I'm gonna go into finance, make some money, and then I'll do something worthwhile. Mm. And actually that's just a completely false uh, agenda because finance, even finance exists because actually it performs a purpose and, and you have a sacred trust in finance, in fund management, to be a steward of other people's money. So you're looking after that. They've entrusted you with their, with their savings and you're looking after their savings. So the first thing is to make sure that uh, everybody who works with you and for you understands the purpose of what they're doing and believes in it. And I would encourage the person to ask the question, not every company does that. So they try and identify companies that are purposeful, that they, they understand their purpose and that they are client-centric, they're servants to their clients. Uh, that's the, the first thing. So um, now that may not be sufficient for some. So if I'm, some may say, well, you know, okay, but looking after people's savings, that's not enough for me. Um, and then so I think the second thing is that within, the, uh, if you're in a, in a business which creates wealth, then I think it, you can start pretty early uh, doing really interesting things with that wealth. So I was just this morning, our head of technology has been working with one of our art schools in Wandsworth, and they've completely redecorated and rebuilt the technology to create a sixth form hub, create the technology center. They've sent in, they send in every week one of their, one of our coders to teach about coding. Um, and we're gonna have an internship for all the six formers at the school uh, in coding. There's a massive shortage in Britain of teachers in coding. Yeah. Um, and the six form applications for that school, which was a failing school five years ago, gone from 80 last year to 150 this year, they've doubled. And the, our capacity is 100. And all of the people on our tech team are doing that. They're incredibly, it's incredibly rewarding. And now the next step is say, well, how can we do that for the whole art network? How can we transform the way technology and coding is done for the whole network? So I think that there are, there are lots of things everybody can do starting quite small um, uh, and then growing bigger and bigger. And, and, uh, and then finally, if, if that's not enough, then you can always, if you, if you've made a lot of money, then you can go and, become a you know a use entirely focused venture philanthropist and create your own um uh venture and do something you know completely unique mm -hmm. very good very good well you end on a very encouraging uh and inspiring note and uh and uh, I wanted to just thank you Paul there's so much positive feedback in the questions and in the chat in terms of the insights that you've provided and your book is wonderful it's full of both theory and philosophy and uh and and also practical experience and it's a very unusual mix to get all of those things into into one uh rather concise volume um so short <laughs> it is short <laughs> it is it's short on length but long on ideas how's that <laughs> So, uh, so thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us. Thank you to the audience for all of your excellent questions. Uh, it's been, it's been a, a fantastic occasion and, uh, and we've really enjoyed it and learned a great deal. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Minish, really enjoyed it. Very good. And take care of yourselves, everyone. Have a lovely evening and uh, come back for more. We'll be, all, we'll